I don't know how often you read the Psalms and the Proverbs. Did you ever get one of those New Testaments with the Psalms and the Proverbs and the Gospels? I did. And I remember flipping it open as a kid, reading some of these Proverbs, thinking some of these are kind of strange. Um, I mean, some are accurate, like Proverbs 17, 21. To have a fool for a child brings grief. There is no joy for the parent of a godless fool. Amen. <laughs> or Proverbs 11. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. I don't think that would pass the Me Too movement <laughs> test, would it? They did not apply that filter back when this was written. It's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. It's in there. Look it up. Proverbs 21. I'm not kidding. And uh, let beer be for those who are perishing, wine for those who are in anguish. And all you ladies say, amen. <laughs> amen, brother. I, you probably heard this one, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Have you heard that one? Yeah, have you heard this one before? He who blesses his friend with a loud voice early in the morning, it will be reckoned a curse to him. In, in other words, like, don't be loud in the morning, Sam. That's what it's saying. But there is also great wisdom, as much fun as we were having, there is great wisdom in the Proverbs, for example, about pride. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. These are great words to live by. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction, and even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues which is true. My dad would say, um, better to hold your tongue and have them think you're a fool than to open it, your mouth, and remove all doubt. <laughs> My dad said that a lot. I don't know why he said that a lot to me. It's just now starting to dawn on me why he said that a lot. You know, people these days are struggling. And there have always been mental and emotional health issues among Canadians. None of us is a perfect specimen of mental and emotional health, but these days it just seems harder, right? See, we used to have things in our lives that helped us. When we were struggling, when we were feeling down, when things weren't going our way, we could participate in certain activities that would kind of help us out a little bit, like Maybe we'd go out for dinner with friends and just share our troubles or just share a, a, a glass of Coke and, and some chicken wings. And Okay, maybe I'm talking about myself here, but I find chicken wings and a glass of Coke always help, especially with good friends around. Maybe you would take a trip. I know for my wife, this is a big deal. Every, maybe twice a year, we try, try to take a trip, whether it's Disney or out to New Brunswick to see my parents or whatever it is. She just has a better emotional health when she knows that she can kind of get out of here for a little while and go see something new. Or just to get outside. And, and Canadians have been going outside in record numbers, which means that if you tried to get into a provincial park on the weekend this summer, you may have faced a long, long lineup just trying to get into the park. So it's even harder to get out to certain places or just spend time with loved ones, and it can be hard to do that. On the opposite, maybe you're spending a little too much time with certain loved ones, amen? No, you didn't want to amen that one? Okay. You wanted to go home and have peace at home over lunch. Okay, I get that. I get that, I set you up. Maybe visit a counselor or a psychotherapist, but for, the, for a while, we couldn't even do that. And now, a lot of the times, you can only do that via a computer screen. So we've had these kind of coping techniques that help us stay emotionally and, 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 and spiritually and psychologically healthy, but now, <clears throat> what do we have? How do we now combat the boredom and the monotony of COVID life? 
Well, we have really one recourse. Dun dun! <laughs> Netflix. You see, we may have had our struggles with mental health issues in February, but come March, a lot of our coping mechanisms were taken away from us. All of a sudden, back in March, all of the rules changed, and along with it, our coping mechanisms. We can't so easily just go out for dinner with friends. We can't travel. We can't get outside because our parks are full. I remember hearing from a parishioner who had a, a, a brand new granddaughter and that little baby was born and she couldn't go and hug that little newborn baby. Can you imagine? I remember walking a very difficult journey with a parishioner whose husband was passing away. She couldn't get in to see him except at the very end. And I can't even imagine how heartbreaking that would be for me if that were Nikki in the hospital and I couldn't be with, there, with her as her life slipped away. I just I can't imagine the emotional toll that these things take on people. And so I might tell them to go see a counselor, but even now it's hard to do that except for maybe a telephone or a computer screen, which just isn't quite the same. The rules changed. Our freedoms were removed. Our human interactions were limited. And add to that a healthy dose of fear and anxiety. And it's no wonder that we're struggling. And I'm not just making this up, folks. Statistics are showing that we are struggling. The Center for Addiction and Mental Health released a report, and here's what they said. They said COVID-19 is having a negative impact on Canadians' mental health, with many seeing their stress levels double since the onset of the pandemic. Double. People are struggling with fear and uncertainty about their own health and their loved ones' health, concerns about employment and finances, and the social isolation that comes from public health measures such as quarantining and physical distancing. A recent poll found that 50% of Canadians reported worsening mental health since the pandemic begin, began, and many feeling worried and anxious. 44% of us are saying we're worried. 41% of us say that we have anxiety. And then to add to the trouble, 25% of Canadians aged 35 to 54 and 21% of 18 to 34 year olds say that they've increased their alcohol consumption since social distancing and self-isolation began. And so we do have a few coping mechanisms left to us, but maybe they're not the healthiest of coping mechanisms. This is a problem. Where do we look for help? Where do we turn for wisdom in this very difficult time? Well, I believe that we can always turn to scripture for wisdom in times like this. Written over many centuries, these words express the faith of men and women who came to a profound understanding of God in the midst of suffering and hardship. Today, I'd like us to take a quick look at just one little part of scripture. I'd like us to take a look at a couple Proverbs, that book of wisdom that was collected for our benefit. And I have two Proverbs in mind. Now, first of all, before we get into this proverb, you need to know that this book is a book of very short sayings that were collected about how to live life well, how to live life as a godly man or woman. And, and so, while some of them might be funny, some of them are also very profound and very deep. So <clears throat> let's look at Proverbs 11. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. How can that be? A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. People curse the one who hoards grain, but they pray God's blessing 
on the one who is willing to sell. In other words, is a publication of the Wycliffe Bible Translators. And in this publication, in other words, it tells the story of Sadie Saker, which I'm pretty sure Spider-Man dated in one of his comment, comics. Sadie Saker, Peter Parker, fine. Sadie Saker served as a house missionary for years. She was a house parent in the Philippines. So while missionaries were out doing their thing, she would look after the children. Now Sadie loved books and she brought many books with her. And although she gladly loaned many of her books out, she had certain books that she treasured above all else. And so she took the books and she put them in a footlocker and she slid it under her bed for safekeeping. Some weeks and months go by and one night Sadie is laying in bed. She hears chewing. She hears gnawing. And she looks under her bed to investigate. She sees nothing, so she pulls out the trunk and she discovers that the noise is coming from her footlocker. When she opened the footlocker, all she found was a pile of dust. All the books that she had kept for herself had been eaten by termites. I think this well illustrates what is meant by one person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. I don't know if this has been your experience of God, but I find that God often turns things upside down. And this is one of those situations. How could it possibly be that when we give things away, we get more than we had before? How is that even possible? I know many um, wealthy people in my life, and a lot of them won't spend a dime unless they really have to. And my dad would always say, rich people are rich for a reason. They don't part with their money too easily. I don't know if that's the case, but that wisdom would not seem to fly in the face of this passage of scripture, because it suggests the more you give away, the more you gain. The question is, are we talking about financial gain? What we give away, we keep, what we hoard, we lose our wealth, our possessions, even our health will eventually fade away. But what I started to learn is that our acts of kindness, the love that we show to other people, acts of generosity, love, and charity, they never fade away. They are never lost. They have this cumulative effect that makes this world a better world in which to live. So perhaps because of the Christmas spirit within you, you treat that overworked cashier with a little bit more respect or grace than you normally would. Or you let that car that's waiting to turn left in to turn left, or you smile simply say Merry Christmas to someone who looks overwhelmed or overworked. Or maybe you just drop off some blankets or groceries at your local food bank or church. You have no idea how these small investments of patience and grace and generosity add up to so much more than what you have been given. But the great thing is, you will gain when you give. I remember a few years back, I decided that I wanted to do some Christmas caroling. You might remember this. Many of you joined me on that first one. And uh, no one really knew how it was going to look, but I had a kind of an idea because I'd done it before. So we all gathered here. I gave them some addresses and some lyrics and said, go to these places, knock on the door, and sing. It's as simple as that. We sing one, two, maybe three songs, and then on to the next address we go. And then we were going to meet up at Tim Hortons for coffee after to kind of debrief and just enjoy some fellowship. Well, I have to tell you, the excitement around the coffee at Tim Hortons 
was maybe the best thing about my Christmas that year. You see, we went and knocked on doors of people who just weren't expecting it. And what they found at their door was just a little bit of joy that they had never thought was coming their way. I remember standing crowded into this uh, at, at 550 King into Crystal's room. Crystal is, no offense, probably my favorite parishioner. She is so smart and so funny and she flirts with me incessantly. I love it. She's also around 90. Okay, you need to know that too. I love Crystal and we all kind of crowded in her room and by the end of the second song she was just in tears of joy. You know, we gave of our time, we gave of our gas, we gave of whatever fears we might have of singing in public, but we gained her tears of joy. And you can't buy that. It is worth so much more than anything we gave up that day. Dear church, I learned in that moment what it says here, one person gives freely, yet gains even more. What we give away, we keep. Martin Luther has said, I have tried to keep things in my hands and lost them all, but what I have given into God's hands, I still possess. The industrialist Henry Ford, who I'm sure you know, he is not responsible for the fact that my left rear reverse sensor isn't working or that my doors freeze in the winter, I hope. He was once asked to donate money for the construction of a new medical facility. And the billionaire said he would pledge $5,000, which is a very generous sum back in the day. And the next day, the newspaper released a headline and the headline read, Henry Ford contributes $50,000 to the local hospital. So one little zero made a big difference in this situation. And the irate Ford got on the phone immediately and he complained to the newspaper that he'd obviously been misunderstood, whether by the fundraiser or by the paper, it didn't matter. He was Henry Ford and you should listen to him and fix it. Well, the fundraiser said, well, Mr. Ford, we would be happy to print a retraction in the paper the next day. We will have them print, Henry Ford reduces his donation by $45,000. <laughs> Realizing the poor publicity that result would result, the industrialist agreed in the end to pay the $50,000 contribution but there was one catch, that he would give them the money, but above the entrance to the hospital was to be carved in stone permanently this Bible verse, I came among you and you took me in. <laughs> Clever guy. Now let me ask you this. Who do you think that that $45,000 would have blessed more? Henry Ford or the hundreds or thousands of people who come through that hospital to be blessed with care and love and compassion? He did not need that money. $45,000 was like 45 bucks to me. He didn't need it. The people that received it they needed it. And I can't help but think that it sounds to me like he missed out on a blessing. Because he gave the money, but he didn't receive any joy from it. He didn't receive any blessing, any refreshing from his generosity. Which brings me back to Proverbs 11. And I don't know if you resonated with this line when it was read, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. 
A few years ago, Knox, spent, <clears throat> Knox sponsored a family. And they were a local Midland family, and they were affiliated with our church, and they've since moved out of the community. Great people. And I remember one day I was in the grocery store with my wife, and we ran into this single mom and her teenage kids. And when we talked to them for a little bit, and then we went on, she said, did you, did you hear what she was saying to them? I said, no. She said, well, she said to the kids, you each have $2 to spend because all I have is 10 bucks. I mean, I knew the family and I knew it was true. She was giving her kids the last of her money to go buy some chips or pop or something. They're probably going to have a family night. And I was so touched. Nikki was so touched by, by her love for her kids. She'd just give them every last ounce. And so we decided we would help them out that Christmas. And boy, did we help them out. I think that's the year we partnered with the OPP and, and stuff just came in. My truck was packed. And so we pull up a few days before Christmas that there's so much snow on the street. Everything's piled high. They live high up on a hill. I pull the truck up. I say, come on out. I said, no, I need everyone to come out. They said, well, why? I said, well, here. I opened the tailgate, hand them some packages, said, take those inside. They said, okay. I said, now come back down. They said, why? I said, all of this is for you. And the look on their faces, their jaws hit the floor, and the tears started to come. And it took us 10 minutes to bring everything inside. And afterwards, they sent me a card, and she called me, and she said, the kids told me this is the best Christmas they have ever had. And I knew in my heart that that was the kind of Christmas they would remember for the rest of their lives. And it has to deep down inside those teenage kids when they're adults remember that too, right? And one of them pass that on and be the kind of loving and generous and caring people that give away to then receive more than they ever gave. It is amazing how God works, church. When we give away, we somehow get so much more in return. And I love this line, whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Now, I know that this is a difficult time. And for many of you, Christmas will be even harder. I think, in fact, I know that when we focus on other people and their needs and how we can show love and compassion to them, all of a sudden, our problems become a little less and the joy that we receive in helping them overshadows the struggles that we have in many ways. And so, even when I'm feeling exhausted and overworked, there is just something about giving at Christmas that far surpasses the fatigue. Nothing engenders a cheerful heart at Christmas quite like generosity. After all, it is a celebration, right, of the greatest gift that has ever been given. God himself wrapped in swaddling cloths and laying in a manger. And this leads me to the second proverb that I have for us this morning. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Amen. You know, this Christmas may not be Christmas as usual. We may have to play by different rules. Staying healthy is not going to be as easy as it once was, but church, we have the same refreshing available to us that we have always had. And when we focus on others at Christmas, if even for a few hours, suddenly our problems just don't seem quite as big. And we might even begin to feel a little bit of that Christmas cheer. And friends, that is good medicine indeed. Let us pray.